Okay, so um, I'd like to start by saying um, welcome. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today for this presentation on accessibility in OJS software and publications. Um, my name is Kate Shuttleworth, and I have my our two presenters with me here today, who I will introduce in just a moment. Um, before we get started, I did want to start with a land acknowledgement um, by acknowledging that the three people that you'll be hearing from today, myself as your moderator and our two presenters, are all located in Canada, and the Public Knowledge Project is a core facility at Simon Fraser University in Burnaby, British Columbia. Simon Fraser University is located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. And I'm speaking to you today from my home on the unceded territory of the Katsi First Nation. I know many of you may be joining us from Canada or perhaps elsewhere in North America or elsewhere in the world. And I invite you, if you'd like to, to share an acknowledgement of the lands you are on using the chat. Um, a, a few quick details of how the session will go today that I'll just briefly share with you. I mentioned that the session is being recorded. Um, you'll notice that your mic is muted right now, but you do have your mic enabled. Um, we have videos disabled for attendees, um, but you will be invited to unmute at the end of the session during the Q&A if you'd like to ask questions that way. You're also welcome to add your questions to the chat or the Q&A um, at any time, and I'll be monitoring those and we will we'll return to them at the question period at the end. We also invite you to follow along with the slides that our presenters have um, generously shared. I'm going to go ahead and put those in the chat, the link to the slides. Um, so please feel free to follow along if that's useful. And we also have captions enabled in the Zoom today. So you'll find those at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers. So with me today, I have Israel Sefrin. Um, among his other roles, Israel is the Digital Accessibility Specialist at the Public Knowledge Project. And Maria Maestrovskaya is a member of the PKP Publication Services team and a former lead of PKP's Accessibility Interest Group. So with that, I will pass it over to them. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Just testing if you can hear me right now. Yeah, sounds good, Israel. Okay, great. So uh, just a brief introduction to our uh, our outline here. So we are talking in two parts here, the accessibility in the OJS software and the accessibility in the OJS content. I work with the first part, just on our outlines here. Maria, we're working the second part of the content, and then we have our questions and answers set part here. So accessibility in OJS software. Uh, just give a brief introduction to the uh, term or the topic here. So when you talk about web accessibility, we're not talking about open access, because open access refers to publications that are published online and made freely, freely available to copy, use, and distribute. So to long to read, no charts. Okay, we have levels of open access, but just simple put is no charts when you talk about open access. On the other hand, web accessibility, we are talking about applications usable by people with or without disabilities, uh, providing alternative text for images, closed captions for videos, keyboard navigation interface, nav navigable interface, and make websites compatible with assistive technologies like screen readers. So these two topics covered, they are not directly linked, but it's, it would be awesome if every journal could have both. And then when you talk about web accessibility, we are talking about disabilities. And disability is not a condition, but a mismatch. When you make a system or a service or a product incompatible to everyone. So we're not talking about a kind of a, a health issue here, but more like a software issue or a bug. And we talk about some disabilities when you're just mentioned that we always think, okay, someone that's blind or someone that's deaf, or, okay, this is kind of offensive, but usually people think in a common sense about that. So, but just to give an idea in North America, the cognitive disability is more than hearing and vision summed. So when you talk about disabilities, we're not just covering one disability, but many of them, because many people just have not one, but more than one. The most common uh, situation is someone with a two disabilities at once. So someone with a mobility and some kind of cognition disability or hearing and vision disability. So we're not just talking about one at once. Okay, so we know about open access, web accessibility, 
and disabilities, but how it impacts on Node.js or software development. So we have what you call, uh, sorry, next slide, accessibility standards that are guidelines to develop accessible products or services. We have uh, standards made by nonprofit organizations as WCAG, which is made by W3C. More recently, we have the National Standard of Canada, which is based on the European standard. So we have national, we have continent, and the standards are not legislation. They are just recommendations to make a product more accessible. And also we have legislation, which is a uh, mean to enforce these standards. Currently here in Ontario, we have the ODA, which is a uh, legislation that follows WCAG and covers information, communications, education, uh, services, transportation, but other provinces, they have their own uh, uh, law legislation. We have a control legislation as in USA, as the section 508, and we have the continental legislation with the European Accessibility Act. So all these are legislation, and along with the standards, they make a framework of how you work with uh, accessibility in your products. So let's dive into the OGS default theme right now. So which improvements we have from these standards and from this legislation that applies to OGS default theme? As you know, when you install OGS, the very first theme you have is the default theme. It came with the code, so it's built into the system itself. Just a little bit of history here in the background, uh, how we started. In PKP Sprint 2019 in Vancouver, uh, Maria Masovskaya, which is here with us, she brought the subject to the discussion in Sprint when you create a accessibility discussion group. And we have as an outcome to run an accessibility audit in the default theme of OJS, which has happened, which happened in 2020. So these two uh, events or milestones were completed. Uh, and now we have ongoing work happening here. So we have the accessibility statement, which is published, but it's still a work in progress. We started last year the submission wizard accessibility audit as well. So our working is a work that we I'm doing with Devika, which is our UX research and designer, and a discussion we have with Yarda, which is our lead development uh, team here. And more simply, to be more specific, we released a version of our VPAT or ECI or ACR. Uh, for those who doesn't know, uh, this is a document that usually North American universities or companies, they require from software. So any kind, any vendor, it provides AviPet ACR to be approved to government or any other public institution to be able to provide the solution. So now the full team has it as well. Okay, now that's the history. That's how we are working with accessibility, with the legislation, with standards. Let me show you what are the improvements that we are already have in the full theme. I just show a few of them. I'm not showing you all of them because we have a lot of them. Okay, so the first one we have, okay, sorry. Oh, my browser. We have a tab navigation in logical order. So if you go to the OGS demo on our, uh, uh, sites here, you can navigate in a logical order. What does it mean? So the first element on the page that you focus on your uh, tab key, you'll be the uh, cook alert on the bottom of the page. So visually, it is the last item, but logically, it is the first item on the page. So you go navigate and go back to the top, to the menu, to the uh, interaction components on the very top section, and then you go ahead and go back to the down of the page. So this is the logical order, which is really important to someone that can see or cannot uh, use a mouse in a page. Uh, the next one, we have the default theme skip to. So I think many of you are familiar with a component we call skip to, which is like a hidden menu on the top where you can uh, interact with them with your keyboard using tab key as well. Uh, usually they, sites or any other platforms, they just provide you two links, the skip to content or skip to main navigation. But with OGS default theme now, we have these two already, 
and also do any section of the homepage like about journal announcements, the current issue and the footer. So someone that relies only on the keyboard navigation, not just screen reader, but keyboard, someone that doesn't use a mouse can navigate through the interface much faster than going link by link. Uh, no visual headings to create a ta table of content, content structure. So this is more uh, a hidden feature that doesn't affect people that doesn't use it, but it provides a great feature to people that realize on screen readers and tab navigation. So we have like a hidden headings in the page that creates a structure of a, of a headings or a map of the page that can go quickly to every session as we do with skipping two, but it's more like a, it makes part of the page. So we can interact with it with an easier way, even though they show up visually, they show there in the code. So it's more tech stuff, but is a nice feature that we implemented in the default theme. And talk about headings. Uh, when you first have your our OGS default theme, every page has like a title or the heading level one was the journal name. But when you go now to the uh, landing page of the submission, publish it, now the first level of heading is the title of the page, title of the article. So we switched from the title of the, the article, the, the, sorry, the journal, and you go to the title of the article, it, article itself, which is more logical. It makes more sense to someone that's reading the document. So I'm reading the article, not the journal anymore. And we have, now it's improvement that is really technical here, but let me explain to you why does it affect? We use the uh, application, uh, accessibility for rich application language here. And in the past or the previous version, when you just hover with your screen reader or focus with screen reader, the PDF button, the announces, it announced in the uh, your speaker something like PDF button, so uh, or XML button or HTML button. Now we join the title of the uh, publication or the submission publisher with the format and the element. So for example, if you have experience with the screen reader, you can test it in the OGS demo as well. So they will say the title, like scholarly associations and economic viability with a PDF button, title, XML button. So when someone is navigating your page using screen reader, they will be uh, reminded that we are uh, on that article and which format of file will be downloading or opening when interacting with that. These are just a quick examples of improvements. Uh, we have many others. I don't want to take too long on them because my main focus here is to show you two next things. Uh, the first one is what is our current accessibility audit process here? So how we are working, how we are doing our audit process internally right now. The first one in 2020, we hire an external vendor. Now we have more internal work, which involves uh, my uh, consulting with the Vika and ER, the two. So we have a first moment, a manual accessibility checking. We do using our keyboard or using screen readers. Now with just a tip, if you use a Mac and don't do that, but if you use a Mac and hit command and F5, you'll be turning on the voiceover screen reader in your Mac. If you turn it off, command F5 again. So if you're gonna test, go ahead, because it will start to announce about everything to your screen. Uh, but you have the options as JAWS, NVDA, Narrator in Windows, and Linux, Orca, which is not that mature. Along, along with the uh, manual checking, you can have uh, browser plugins, browser plugins uh, as Wave, Headings Map, the Accessibility Insights for the Web, and Silk Tide. All of them, they run on your browser. Some of them run only in Windows as the uh, Accessibility Insights for the Web, or the run till last year. I hope they're still running. Uh, but they are for free. Do have the links on the uh, slide here. You can download it, install on your browser and see which features better. So uh, the Wave Accessibility Insights for the Web and Silk Tide, they do the same thing. Headings map is more like a, to show what's, what, what headings you have in your page right now. 
And after all this checking, we report issues. So we have a spreadsheet to track the issues, we create an ID, we measure the impact, the severity. Uh, we try to fetch the most information to discuss in the future and we give a title, a description. We describe the testing method as a manual, is a automated, is a mix of both, uh, was using a screen reader and then provide screenshots or a code snippet of the uh, issue and then the remediation with development team. And after reporting, we prioritize issues here. So we have a priority roadmap. We'll have a discussion with the WAX developers and any other stakeholders in the team where we can really choose to weigh CAG criteria. Weigh CAG is the standard. And then we can prioritize the work uh, given a, like a high medium, low prioritization, uh, given a rationale for prioritization, the four, the milestone. So it's more like a work discussion in that moment. So just to give an example, this is the screenshot of our roadmap for accessibility, uh, which is uh, conceived by the Vika. And we can see you have the WCAG criteria column, the rationale for prioritization and the prioritization itself. And the four that's given by the developer. So we need to know how much work we need to uh, invest to uh, manage and tackle an issue. And this is something that comes up from a effort team. Okay, now you know what they have been done, have been doing with the default team. Now you know what is our internal process. And now it's your turn to contribute via, via GitHub. So how do you do that? The workflow in a nutshell. You run tests, log into GitHub, report an issue, repeat. Run tests, log into GitHub, report issue. Simple as put like that. So if you don't have a account in GitHub, Create one, it's for free, and find the PKP, PKP, PKP lib repository where we have our issues to be filed. So for example, how can you test and use the OGS? You can navigate in the interface using different themes. You can navigate using keyboard only, navigate using a mobile device, or even can run automated tests using the plugins I just showed you in the past slides. So, but what, what what can I do? So navigate so you know, I don't have any idea how can my contribute make a test. I'm not a developer. So even though you're not a developer, you can complete a task like open a PDF or a HTML, HTML guide, right? Or can you complete a task using a keyboard? Like can you register yourself in your journal? Can you try using screen reader like VoiceOver or NVDA? Does it make sense what is being announced by them while you're typing? Or are the instructions clear to achieve a task? Can you achieve a task only written instructions? So just create a single task, task, make the task, take notes, and then now you can browse the accessibility issues in the repository to see if anyone else has already filed an issue or make a comment on an issue you have filed, for example. So even though there is an issue filed with uh, something that you find as a bug, you can add comments, you can add screenshots, or you can add a remedi remediation you find for your, your journal, for example. In here, I'm not gonna talk, I'm not talk just the, I'm not talking about just the default theme, even though you are using the OGS, the uh, interface, uh, dashboard interface, you can make tests as well. We are doing that right now. So after you find the accessibility, you no, know, there's no issue already filed with the uh, bug you found. Then we can file an issue. Just click on the new issue button, which is green in my interface here because I use a dark theme. And you can have on your from the two templates. The first one is the accessibility issue. And the second one is the bug report. Both are for issues. And in my understanding, both are for bugs because we are talking about bug on the uh, user end. So we are trying to find these bugs and we are trying to tackle them in a timely manner. When you click and set the accessibility issue, be open to you or show to you a template of how to describe the issue you just found. So you take your notes, you create a title for the, that issue, a meaningful title, please. Uh, like there's a problem, it's not a great title. Just try to describe, I cannot download a PDF, clicking on the PDF button, for example, is a great title and you create a description for that issue and how to reproduce that, which is 
how did you find that issue? So I was using my uh, browse like Chrome, Firefox in my Mac OS. And then I was trying to click or try to navigate my keyboard or try to use my screen reader and not working. And what should happen? Uh, what was expected to be happening there? The application, we are talking about OJS, but you can test on the OMP or OPS and provide us the information of the version that you're using and stack the user, like your device. Uh, you're using your laptop, your mobile browser, uh, you're using Chrome, uh, Edge, Firefox, Safari. Uh, where are you using a uh, screen reader? Which one? Is VoiceOver? Is uh, JAWS? Is NVDA? No, if I saw, no screen reader at all. I was using another assistive technology. Uh, we mentioned screen readers because they are the most close you have in your uh, setups here, but you can use anyone. And when you submit this file or when you file this issue, restart the process. So, and track uh, the, the issue you just file here. So this is more a call for collaboration uh, from the community. So uh, as long as you have the, your journals running your own uh, servers, for example, you can make this test or you can make the test using our demo or test drive installation that are available freely to everyone here. So I talk about a lot of content here and thank you for attention. I just give you a lot of information right now. So as appreciation of that, I would like to give you what I call of a kitten bonus, which is my cat. This is Amy, she's here right now. Uh, yeah, she's living right now here. And just to let you know, she's really into accessibility standards. So she's worked with me and helped me a lot. So you can see she's sitting with me right now. So thank you again. Now I pass to Maria. I Thank you. Here. We're going to uh, have this little awkward pause to switch over the slides. Just give me one moment. Can you confirm for me that you can see my slides? Yeah, you can. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So Israel spoke to us about accessibility in OJS as a software, and I will talk about accessibility in OJS content. We intentionally split up the uh, workshop in these two parts, but where exactly do we draw the line? What is software and what is content when it comes to accessibility? I like to use the metaphor of an empty house. Software is your journal structure, the, um, the, the house that you get your keys to when you first install your OJS. This is your default theme, which was made uh, as accessible as we currently have it. As Israel outlined, we're still making improvements to it. We will continue making improvements to it. But this is the house that you move into. Content is everything you bring with you your website content that you enter into predetermined boxes, like your about page, your masthead, your footer, the new static pages you create that you can add content to, your announcements, your emails, and finally, the actual journal content you publish, which is the bread and butter of an OJS journal. And it is important to underline that just because the default theme as the software is accessible or as accessible as it is right now, does not automatically make the content accessible. And we need to pay attention to the content we create and input and how we do it in order to make sure we do not break that accessibility accidentally. So what exactly do I mean by that? When you move into your house, when you bring in your furniture, when you want to paint the walls, that is when you want to keep in mind a few core principles of content accessibility. The colors that you bring, so make sure that you're using proper contrasting colors and accessible palettes. If you're adding images, make sure they are provided with alternative text description. And OJS has provisions for those. It has um, text boxes for you to enter alt text into. If you're adding links, make sure they don't say um, click here or look there, but whether that links are descriptive and can be read out by the screen reader and be understood by the screen reader's user. Heading structure and page, Israel touched on that. He mentioned 
of heading one is the journal title on the home page or the article title on the article landing page. So if you are creating new pages like your static pages, make sure not to add extra heading ones because heading one already exists in the structure. So you'll want to start with heading two and then move sequentially without skipping them, even if you like the look of a heading three more than the look of a heading two. And of course, if you are creating a custom CSS for your OJS journal, you will have an opportunity to make even more significant changes through it and move blocks around, change fonts, hide certain elements. So it is very important to keep accessibility in mind when you make those changes. And it will be a good idea to retest your journal after you have made significant changes like that. Some of the um, testing tools um, Israel has outlined, but testing with a human is always best. And finally, a word on plugins. There are some plugins that work in the background, and there are some plugins that will appear publicly, maybe in your sidebar on the article landing page, and they may bring visual elements with them as well. Not all plugins are made accessible just yet. Not all plugins are created by PKP either. There are a number of plugins, in fact, maybe most plugins, I don't know the stats, are contributed by community members and our development partners. So it will be a while before all are brought into this accessible framework. So for now, just be mindful of the things you add and things you install. I'm linking here to the inclusive and accessible theming guide that goes over these considerations for when you are customizing your own journal. But of course, the bread and butter of an OGS journal is the content you publish, your actual articles or data sets or other content. So how do you make that accessible? Good news is that the principles are the same uh, as what I have already talked about and what Israel has talked about. And we refer back to the standards that we follow for these principles, like the WCAG standard, making sure that there is alternative text for images, making sure that we have proper color contrast, descriptive URLs, structured headings, identified lists, etc. I will not be able to dive deeper into each of these principles because this could be a topic for a whole other course. In fact, such courses exist, and many of them are a fantastic way to uh, upskill you in the, in the area of creating accessible content. So I'm linking here to our Creating Accessible Content Guide uh, for authors and editors that outlines these principles and also links out to, um, to, to the dedicated courses and resources that you can follow if you would like to learn about each of these topics. Oops. But I would like to uh, give an example of a piece of content that is uh, easy to create in, in an inaccessible way if, you don't, if you're not mindful of some of the principles of accessibility. And it's also something that will be much more difficult to correct later if you receive it as part of your manuscript submission. And I'm talking about content visualizations like graphs and um, charts. So here's an example of a graph. Um, I'm going to give you a moment to uh, think about what is wrong with this graph. You don't have to put anything in the chat unless you want to, you're welcome to, but just take a moment to think about it. All right, so a few things. First of all, color reliance. What we uh, mean when we say color reliance is that the only way to understand the graph is to rely on color. Information is only conveyed through color. How do you know if there is color reliance in a graph? Imagine that you would print it out on a black and white printer. Would it still be readable? In this case, obviously not, because that, then I will lose my reference point. I will lose my reference of what is as a kid or as an adult in this case. So that's one strike against the graph. The second strike is the use of the colors. So even if I'm looking at it as um, a person with a particular kind of color blindness, maybe I do not have a full visual disability, I'm still able to see the graph, but I have color blindness that prevents me from distinguishing between these two colors. Once again, it means that the information loses meaning. 
Um, and finally, uh, if I were a user of a screen reader, this graph would also not be very meaningful to me because all information is just embedded inside an image. So how can we make this graph better? Here is an attempt. Um, here are a few things we did. First of all, we eliminated color reliance by adding data labels to the bars. So now I know the difference between 90% and 86% because I have these numbers right there on the graph. I have also switched to an accessible color palette and I've added texture or pattern to one of the bars, which means that if I were to print it out on a black and white paper, black and red printer, then um, the difference between the two would still be obvious. However, for a user of a screen reader, this graph is still not very helpful. So what can we do then? We talked previously about adding alternative text to images. When it comes to more complex graphs and more complex pieces of information, um, alternative text may not be enough. This is where we would want to provide uh, a long form description and essentially break, this down, break down the graph and information contained in the graph into text. You would want to have this long form description next to the graph in your article or available by clicking on a link and that will take you to the long form description elsewhere. In that case, in your alt text, you would want to enter the name of the graph and a reference to that long form description. You do not want to duplicate the description from the long form portion to the alt text because then the screen reader will end up reading them twice. So this is just an example of something that we encounter a lot in um, academic and research publishing and a graph created in an inaccessible way is much harder to fix down the road after the article has already been submitted or has already been accepted. If it goes into layout editing production and suddenly you're like, oh, wait, I need to make this graph accessible. Well, this will make it progressively more difficult down the road if it wasn't created accessible to start with. And of course, the question of accessibility of our published content is always linked with the formats in which we publish. So that is what I want to talk about next. We are very tied to PDF. PDF is the most common format in scholarly publishing, and that speaks to the legacy we have inherited from print publications. But these days, really, there is no reason to hold on to it so tightly, even though it is very easy to produce. I understand it's really easy to lay out your document in, say, Microsoft Word, and then just convert it to PDF and be done. Unfortunately, PDFs are known for not being great for accessibility, even if the source document for the PDF was made accessible. There are lots of uh, resources out there. You can read on how to make a PDF accessible. It is not an easy, a straightforward process. So instead of investing time and resources into that, why not consider alternative formats, such as, for example, HTML. It is more flexible than PDF, can be made more accessible through tagging and structure. It is also better for full text searching and indexing. And the barrier for entry into creating HTMLs is not all that high. It is possible to learn how to create accessible HTMLs pretty easily. One thing though, if you remember one thing from my presentation today is please, please do not create HTMLs by saving your Word documents as an HTML. It may look fine on the surface, but on, on the back end in its underbelly, Microsoft Word adds a lot of its own formatting into that document, which isn't good for screen readers, nor is it good for you if you ever have to go back and correct something and find your place in that document, it creates a very messy HTML. So in that guide I referenced earlier, um, create an accessible content for authors and editors, uh, we we'll link out to a few resources on how to create simple HTML documents without the use of Word. And then of course there is XML, which is a very flexible format. It allows for semantic tagging additional, in addition to structural tagging. And it is also beneficial for some databases for indexing, it's required by PubMed Central, for example, but it does require XML expertise to create. And many journals that publish in XML 
outsource their uh, typesetting to professional typesetters. Then there is also EPUB, which has all the same flexibility as HTML because it is an HTML-based standard. It can be created with a fluid layout design that will um, adjust to different screen sizes, and it even comes with its own accessibility recommendations. Uh, and I just wanted to clarify, like these are the most common ones, but OJS doesn't really limit you in the kind of format you can upload. You can upload anything to OJS, right? Um, I know journals that publish podcasts and videos. Just remember that whichever format you upload, consider the accessibility implications. For videos and audio, for example, you will want to accompany them with closed captions or audio descriptions. All right, so logical question here is, if HTML is so much better than PDF for publishing, then why doesn't OJS do HTML by default? Well, I have some good news for you. There are plans in the works to add a document-centric workflow to OJS where an HTML editor would be available in the production section of OJS. And it will allow editing the article text right there and then combine it with the metadata that's already entered into the system during the submission process. And then that combined content, metadata, and the document itself can be used to create PDF or to create XML from it. This, is, this plan is in the early stages. Uh, I don't have a timeline for you just yet, but stay tuned and I'm very excited about something like this coming down the pipelines for OJS. All right, so we've talked about formats. We talk about what needs to be done to make a document accessible. Now, the question is, who should be the one doing that? Should it be done by the author? Should the author provide the document that's already accessible when it's submitted as a manuscript? Or should content accessibility be the responsibility of the editorial team? Well, there isn't a single correct answer to this question because it's a complex question. But I think the um, ideal scenario lies somewhere in the middle. Consider that as content creators, authors are better positioned to provide certain content accessible from the get-go like that graph that I showed that was created with color reliance or alternative text for figures, long form text description for images, accessible tables or designated headings in the order in which the author prefers them to appear. At the same time, providing authors with this long list of formatting requirements and essentially making them become accessibility experts may not always be realistic and may create undue barriers to submission. And then that submission still may have to go through remediation and review by editors. So find your place somewhere on the spectrum and consider a combination of attainable instructions for authors, as well as accessibility training for the editorial team or designated editor who will be able to identify issues, work with the author to remediate them, or remediate them during the typesetting process. I'm linking here a couple examples of accessibility guidelines for authors to give you some ideas. And if your journal is interested in pursuing accessibility further, consider also adding an accessibility statement for your journal. What you would want to list in it is your definition of accessibility and the standards you follow, a little bit like what Israel um, outlined for us today. Here is where you can also refer to your local accessibility legislation, as well as point out that maybe based on your local legislation, you are not required to provide accessible content up until a certain year, but you can by request. Uh, you can refer to the TDAB accessibility in OJS as a platform by linking out to the OJS accessibility statement for the default theme or the VPAT, which Israel mentioned. And you can also outline the state of content accessibility in the journal. It is okay to admit that not all content may be accessible as long as you are taking steps to improve accessibility as well as provide um, contact information and tools for the readers to request an accessible version of a document or to report an issue. And um, I'm also sharing here a few examples of such statements and policy language for you to um, get some ideas from. And finally, 
cannot really do a presentation these days without talking about AI, right? Is AI here to save us all? Will it make everything inaccessible accessible? There are definitely some very promising tools coming out now with uh, the AI revolution, such as, for example, auto-generated text alternatives for images. Uh, Mozilla recently rolled this out with Firefox. There are new text-to-audio tools, new ways to control access on the page through voice, and uh, tools for format conversion and content enrichment. Too many to name, and I'm curious to see which ones of them stick. So I'm just linking um, a summary article from Scholarly Kitchen that goes over some of these tools and what they mean for published digital content. All right. That is pretty much it for my section. We have a slide here that links out to the guides that both Israel and I have mentioned, as well as the accessibility statement and the VPAT and the link to GitHub where you can report an accessibility issue. So you will have all of that in the slides. And finally, uh, kitten bonus. I do not have a cat of my own anymore, but thankfully Israel has so many that he has shared a couple with me. <laughs> and now we can proceed to q and I think. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to turn this over to Kate. Wonderful. Thank you both so much um, for that great presentation. We have some um, gratitude for you both for, your, um, for showing us your kittens. <laughs> So thank you for that. Um, we do have one question in the chat, which I'll read out, and I will just take a moment to invite folks. Um, now is the time if you'd like to share a question, either in the chat or the Q and A, um, and I'll uh, we'll start there, and then in just a moment I'll invite folks to unmute if you'd like to share a question that way. Um, I also will say I have been I'm trying to keep up with sharing the links. Um, that our presenters were sharing throughout the presentation today in the chat, but I realize it's a quite a quant uh, quantity of of links and just of information in general today. So we will be circulating the slides as well as the recording. Um, so if you didn't have a chance to grab all those links and you're interested in some, then um, rest assured you'll have the slides as well. Um, okay, so the question um, is about keywords, and um, we have. Um, a follow up just to get a little bit more information. So I might ask um, this individual to, if you'd like to unmute and share a little bit more um, so we can understand um, the issue that you're facing and, and the connection to accessibility in particular. But Israel, um, this question is for you. So um, the person says, I have been facing several issues when trying to fill in the keywords in the metadata. Can you suggest ways to report or resolve this problem? Um, and then we asked for a little bit more information and they said the keywords do not save. Instead, a message appears explaining what a keyword is. Then I need to refresh the journal page to try entering the keywords again. And this process takes a long time, but it should be quite simple. So um, there's, Jonas has suggested um, perhaps posting this in the forum, but I'll just open it up, Israel, in case you have anything to add there. Uh, yeah, I would just I'd like to add if it is like a, a dashboard issue only or the interface of it. So I think Jonas just jumped in here. So I think it's more like a software issue than the interface one. However, if you are trying to use not a mouse, but a, your keyboard, you're not able to save the keywords in the form, then it's a interface issue. And I invite you to uh, provide us some screenshots either to the GitHub repository and open like a accessibility issue too. So yeah, the first action uh, I would recommend to post in the forum first to see if it's like, what is the uh, issue here? Is the software or the interface? So if it's the software, I think the forum might help. But if persists as the interface issue that you cannot save, even click clicking using your keyboard or tabbing to navigate the elements here, then the interface one, please uh, provide us further information using your our template of uh, accessibility issue, please. Great, thanks, Israel. And then we have a comment from Emily um, Hopkins um, about the EFF podcast episode about accessible tech. Um, she says that's super interesting and includes some good discussion around benefits and limits of AI tools. And there's a link there uh, if folks would like to take a look at that. Um, and unless I've missed any, I don't see any additional questions right now. So I will just pause um, to see if folks would like to um, raise your hand and then unmute and ask your questions.
Okay, and we do have another question in the chat um, from Jules. Um, does PKP have any plans to create more accessible themes beyond the default? Uh, we have a discussion internally. Uh, this is a question more to Devika. I think she's not here any, uh, right now, but we are working on the next version of a default theme. Uh, we are in the stage of discussion about that and the accessibility by default it's one of the required requirements to make it more accessible from the beginning. And just a clarification here, when we talk about uh, accessibility, uh, and that's correct, the term is we are working to make more accessible, not to make or not accessible, because accessibility is like a utopia, but it's a goal we have to make everything more accessible. So when people, is my journal accessible? Maybe, maybe not. It's more accessible, less accessible. So we are trying to improve the themes to make them more accessible. So yes, we do have plans to uh, make a newest version uh, more accessible and from the beginning and to allow people to create child themes for from this one too. So plus, please be tuned that the default theme is still under uh, work. So we are always improving the accessibility in the default theme to the current version. That's great, thanks Israel. And any other questions from our audience here? And if not, um, I can go ahead and thank our presenters and we can wrap up a few minutes early. Um, thank you, Israel and, and Maria. That was a very in, uh, enlightening and useful presentation. I hope um, folks enjoyed attending today. Thank you so much to all our attendees for taking the time with us. Um, I'll also just um, say a quick thank you to Aruj Nazami for her work in planning this. Um, she's not here right now, but she did a, a great deal of work in the outset of getting this organized. Um, and I hope everyone has an enjoyable rest of your day.